a few slides. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, that's the first slide again. There we go. Uh, so the first slide that we're looking at is small business optimism. And uh, this is basically, uh, for parallel construction, you're going to see that each of the slides we go through is going to look a lot like this. Uh, and so the blue part uh, to the left of the slide uh, is what happened from the uh, 2012 election through the 2016 election. Uh, and the dotted uh, blue line is the trend that President Trump inherited from the previous president. And the red line is what actually happened with the data. Uh, and so I think that if you look at this chart, you can see that the first thing is small business optimism. Uh, the middle chart is the percent reporting now is a good time to expand. The last one is the percent expecting higher real sales in six months. I think if you look at any of those, you'd say, geez, that doesn't really look like the continuation of a recent trend. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, the next chart is something that in my uh, first presser here way, way back uh, last fall we talked a lot about. Uh, it's business investment, uh, which is uh, more than $300 billion over the trend. Again, if you look at the blue line on the left, uh, the first chart is non-residential fixed investment, uh, and the dotted line is the trend and the growth rate of that uh, that President Trump inherited. Uh, for the middle uh, uh, chart is structures uh, or buildings, and that, as you can see, the dotted line is something that's headed straight down. And then the final chart is equipment investment, and that went straight down before President Trump was elected. And I think that if anyone were to assert that the uh, capital spending boom that we're seeing right now was a continuation of the trend that President Trump inherited, then, well, you know, they wouldn't get a high grade in graduate school for that assertion. Uh, the next chart, please. Uh, durable goods orders, capital goods orders, it's a key part of the economy, and it's one of the factors that we look at most closely because it characterizes basically the, the, the good-paying jobs, uh, the jobs that affect normal Americans, blue-collar Americans. Uh, and the first chart is core capital goods orders, uh, and the second chart is core capital goods shipments. Uh, and if you look at it, the blue, again, shows a, a clear downward trajectory. Uh, and billions of dollars, uh, and then that trajectory reversed itself completely when President Trump was elected. If you were going to assert uh, that the current good news is just the extension of a recent trend, then you'd just simply be factually incorrect. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, here we're looking at uh, the ISM Purchasing Managers Index, which is uh, a survey of uh, people who uh, our purchasing managers uh, for manufacturing firms. And so they're the, the folks that, you know, as the title suggests, manage the purchases. And, and so it's a really great indicator of the economy because you could survey them and say, hey, have you been buying lots of stuff this month or have you not? And uh, the index uh, shows what their uh, responses look like. And you can see that the trend on the purchasing managers index was pretty much flat when President Trump took office. And the red line shows you what happened since that it's, there's a clear uh, inflection uh, right at the election and a, a clear break in the trend. Let's turn to the next one, piece. Now, one of the things that I can remember at the American Enterprise Institute talking a lot about before I came in here was the fact that entrepreneurship in America was falling off. And one of the ways we can measure entrepreneurship is that if you uh, start a new business, then you have to apply for an ID number, a uh, tax ID number for your business. Uh, and so uh, in this chart, we've plotted uh, the EIN applications uh, for new businesses. And if you look at the blue line, uh, they were heading up because heading up we were in a recovery. Uh, but there's a clear upward trajectory way above the trend at the end. And, um, you know, Sarah, like, like, like John Roberts, is a, is a calculus geek. And so she looked at that one and said, geez, that looks like a very strong second derivative to me. <laughs> and then I said, I didn't know you did calculus. And she said, I like calculus better than talking to these guys. Uh, uh, the next ch chart is prime age workers uh, reentering the labor force. And again, if you look at the trend, one of the things people said when we put out our growth forecast that said that we'd have 3% growth was we said that President Trump's policies are going to uh, bring factories back to the U.S., give you the capital spending boom that you saw in the previous chart, and that was going to bring people back into the labor force at precisely the right time. Uh, once again, you can see that there's a clear uh, break of the trend. And so uh, if you see a break of the trend in the capital spending, the new plant formation that gives blue-collar workers their jobs, go to the next slide, please, uh, then maybe we see a break of the trend in blue-collar workers' employment as well. 
And so this is employment for uh, people in goods producing industries. Uh, if you look again at the blue part on the left, you can see that there's a clear downward trend uh, going on in the growth rate of that uh, for President Obama, and then a clear inflection timed almost precisely once again at the election. And the notion, again, that somebody might uh, defensively attempt to assert that this is a continuation of the trend is almost laughable if you look at this chart and you know, look at the rest of them. Now, uh, somebody might say, if you're showing a bunch of charts, well, geez, maybe it depends on when you estimate the trend. And I'm sure that if you went back and began your estimate of the trend at the Civil War and then thought about, well, what trend do we get then? Well, then maybe we're not, you know, you'd get a different answer from what we see. Uh, but another way to sort of test uh, whether the data that I just showed you is a fair representation of what a trend looked like when President Trump was elected is just to compare it to what nonpartisan bodies were saying. So can I have a look at uh, my final chart here? I know. But I, gosh, I heard this sigh of relief when I said final chart. Uh, yeah. so, so, so if you look at the final chart, you'll see that uh, the black line uh, is in, in June of 2017, what the CBO, a Congressional Budget Office, a nonpartisan agency that has a job really of looking at recent trends and projecting it, what they said would happen to capital spending uh, back in 2017. The blue line is what they said in April 2018, and the red line is what's actually happened. And so I would assert that if you look at the, the collective body of evidence, the notion that what we're seeing right now is just a continu continuation of recent trends is not super defensible. And I think that uh, I know that, that we're in, in a political time and passions are high, but as geeky economists, one of the things we have to do is think ahead to you know, what historians will think when they look back at this time. And I can promise you that economic historians will 100% accept the fact that there was an inflection at the election of Donald Trump and that a whole bunch of data items started heading north. Uh, they will, of course, argue for a long time about why that happened. But my final thought for you is just this, that uh, when they do that, and when you watch people uh, do that in the media going forward with op-eds and so on, that you should watch out for ex post theorizing. As an economist, one of the things I most care about is an ex ante theory, something that happens before, and then let's watch the data and then see if it agrees with the theory. That's how you test a theory. You might recall that I came back here uh, last fall, and I told you that if we had the tax cuts that President Trump uh, advised that we, that we have, that he pursued, if we passed them, then there'd be a boom in capital spending this year. Uh, in fact, uh, we provided estimates at the time last fall that said that capital spending this year would go up about 11 percent uh, because of the tax cuts. Uh, so far in the first half of the year, capital spending is up 10 percent. And so you don't have to really reach far for a theory of what happened. President Trump uh, deregulated the economy. We've talked about how that affects growth. The tax cuts have had exactly the predicted effect on the economy. That's brought uh, businesses back to the U.S., factories back to the U.S., and created jobs for ordinary Americans. It's clear in the data that there's been a trend break. And uh, with that, I look forward to taking a few questions before I hand it off to Sarah to talk about other things. And I'll let Mr. Roberts go first, and then I'll maybe try one for each row, because I know I'm not allowed to go for the whole time. All right, Kevin, based on the information that you have given us, where, where, where does the revenue derive from all of these increasing trends meet the deficit line caused by the tax cuts? You know, the, it's a great question. One, one of the things that uh, we could talk about, in fact, Sarah, let's have a whole other briefing. Uh, well, after we do the calculus briefing, let, let's, let's do a, a briefing on, on the deficit. But, but one of the ways to, to think about it is that, that there's been um, a big change in tax law and a big change in spending policy. And uh, in the tax law side, uh, you could remember that the dynamic score uh, for the corporate tax uh, was that it would be very, have a very, very low cost. Uh, and uh, I think that the cost uh, estimate uh, not dynamically scored, and Tyler will nod for me, was about $400 billion in the, in the final bill over 10 years. And clearly, the growth and the investment boom uh, that uh, was projected by CBO was a, a, a significant underestimate for what's happened already. And so I think that the notion that the corporate tax side has about paid for itself is clearly in the data. On the individual side, uh, there was about a trillion dollar cost. About $700 billion of that was a refundable child credit, they got expanded at, at the last minute to get the votes they needed to pass it. Now, a refundable child credit is a uh, you know, very sound policy for people who care about equality of uh, opportunity um, or families with children. Uh, President Trump uh, supported it wholeheartedly, but not at the size that it came out. 
And uh, the child credit, though, is not something that you would expect would pay for itself. And so the tax cuts have increased the deficit a little bit, but not the tax cuts that the Democrats are attacking, but rather the tax cuts that the Democrats probably should have supported. I'll go to row two and right there. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. No, Susie. Yeah. Um, there, there's there's a, another chart that uh, is not included in your packet, and that's the chart about the spike in the consumer price index. Mm -hmm. That's the cost of goods. Mm -hmm. That's inflation yeah, going up at a higher rate <laughs> <laughs> for those who don't. Uh, um, Americans are paying more for their goods now than they did mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in recent years. Can you explain to what extent Americans should be concerned about the fact the price of goods is increasing at a high rate. Right. Well, well uh, Americans should be concerned that prices are going up. Uh, and if you look at the consumer price index, then over the most recent year, then it's a, a little bit short of 3%. And I know that that's something that affects Americans, you know, when they go to the grocery store or the gas station. And they should be concerned about that. But the best defense against increase uh, in inflation is an increase in wages. And the CEA put out a report this week that documented that correctly measured uh, real after-tax wages are growing about 1.4 percent this year. So that means that the wage growth that President Trump has helped create with his policies is overpowering the inflation numbers right now. I'll go to row three and, and then back. Thanks, Dan. Yes, what, what credit, if any, does former President Obama deserve for the current state of the economy? Uh, you know, I, I think that, that uh, attributing blame or credit to individuals requires that I identify policies and then talk about, well, what effect did this policy or that policy have? And I, I prefer to give blame or credit to policies than to individuals. I think that pr President Obama uh, sometimes on the partisan trail uh, gets criticized with numbers that are clearly incorrect because people blame him for the Great Recession, which was you know there when he started, and it's not fair. Uh, if I look uh, specifically at President Obama's policies, there are a whole bunch of policies that I think uh, were very negative for growth. I think the Affordable Care Act lift, lifted a marginal tax rate on individual workers, so much so that the CBO even said that it would have a negative effect on growth. Uh, he increased marginal tax rates on small businesses, and that's why small business creation wasn't so high. And so I could look at a lot of policies, and, and we could talk about them one by one and say, did they help or hurt growth? I think he also advocated policies that he said would help growth that clearly did not. And, and, and really, you know, I kind of wonder about what was going on in the heads of the economists that told them they would, like cash for clunkers and so on, that really didn't have much effect at all. But, 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 but to, you know, say he, he destroyed the economy or something like that, that's not what the CEA chair should be doing. And I'll go back another row. Okay, I'm for, two questions for you. Can I take them separately? You mind? Yeah, I will. Uh, yeah, sure. Just playing off uh, uh, of this question here. But, but yeah, go separately because I'll forget the first exactly. one when you finish the second. Thank yeah. you. Um, you're coming out, obviously, talking about the economic numbers in our first briefing here in nearly three weeks. It seems like it might be time to President Obama's speeches on Friday and Saturday in which he talked about the economy and some of these very issues. Is that why you're here today, or is that just a that, coincidence? You know, th thank you for asking that, actually, be because uh, Sarah can tell you that I've been pushing her to let me show these slides for quite a while, uh, you know, that we've updated them for recent data, but that, in fact, uh, I don't know about the three-week lag. I think it has something to do with the fact that sensible people sometimes, even in the White House, take a break in August, uh, and, and there is some vacation uh, taking at the time. But, but, but yeah, the, the, we were prepared uh, to do this uh, briefing a few weeks ago, and, and there's not in any way a timing that's related to President Obama's uh, Friday remarks. And then I promise you number Thank two. You, very much. Um, th you talked about, obviously, a, but the next person's going to ask for three, you realize. <laughs> so I, I shouldn't under, have done that. Um, um, under President yeah. Trump. The president also, and I'm curious about your view as an economist on this, has told private companies, Apple, Amazon, the NFL, how to run their business. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that's appropriate for a president to do? Do you believe that stimulates economic growth for a president to be dictating how private companies run their stuff? Well, the president has strong opinions about everything. Uh, uh, I think that we wouldn't have had all the policy success that we've had if he hadn't been such a strong advocate for the things that we've seen. Uh, I think that uh, his strong opinions sometimes sometimes stretch into areas that are outside of the places that CEA you know, has any purview. And, and, and uh, you know, I don't counsel him on that. And I think at, at a previous presser, I once said that I don't run the Council of Twitter Advisors. And, and you know, may that may that be true uh, for all of my stay here. Uh, I'll, I'll go back uh, to the, uh, the blue shirt in the back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I skipped a row. Sorry, I'll come forward. Yeah. Quick question for you yeah. on uh, an economic stat that the president put out in a comment today. The president said the GDP rate is higher than the unemployment rate for the first time in over 100 years. Mm -hmm. That's just not true, though, is it? 
Yeah, that's uh, so. So I can tell you what is true, uh, and uh, the history of thought. <laughs> that, that, no, but the, let me just say that the, his, the history of thought of how errors happen is is not something that, that you know I, I can engage in because because like from from the initial uh, fact uh, to what the president said that I don't know the whole chain of command. Uh, but what is true is that that it's the highest in, in ten years, and, and at some point somebody probably conveyed it to him, adding a zero to that, and they shouldn't have done that. And, and I could say that, that uh, at least we, we numbers geeks here at the White House are grateful uh, for, and, and when the press finds mistakes that we make, we don't like making mistakes, but we're grateful when, when they're pointed out because we want to correct them. And you might have noticed that I gave Sarah a, a bad number a few weeks ago. It was 100% my fault, and, and I apologized immediately, and we created it. And you know, I, you'd have to talk to the president about where the number came from, but the correct number is 10 years. Uh, and then I said I would come forward. Yeah. Said president, uh, said president Obama, former President Obama said President Trump would need a magic wand to get to 4% GDP. Uh, the president suggested that was a direct quote from President Obama. Did President Obama ever say that? I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry. And, and, and again, I'm not the chairman of the Council of Twitter Advisors, but I was trying to go back up. Yeah. On wage growth, the White House put out a number that uses a different way of calculating wage growth. Um, it seems like that's unfortunate because you get an apples and oranges comparison to previous wage growth calculations. Um, why is it important to do that? It, it, the new calculation incorporated things that are non-cash benefits like um, vacation time and, and other types of benefits. Um, wh why do that midstream and, and not just base your um, analysis on wage growth based on the way that's been calculated in the past? Yeah, well, yeah, thanks for the question. We have a whole report that came out last week, and there are a lot of news stories that I thought were very well done and thoughtful uh, about the piece. And I think that the question for Americans, what they really want to know is, how are President Trump's policies affecting their lives? And it turns out that the statistic that got the most attention in the media uh, is not a very reasonable statistic for answering that question. And we talked about how to better uh, measure that. And, and, and it was not a criticism of, of the Bureau of Labor Statistics that we, we love those people. We're data geeks. Uh, we use their data to come up with a better measure, but a better measure will account for the fact that people get benefits. A better measure would account for the fact that people just had tax cuts. Uh, a better measure will account for the fact that the composition of the labor force is changing because so many people are coming in, and, and the people who have been out for a while tend to be lower skilled, and so they can bring averages down if you don't control for that. And so in our study, we controlled for all that and showed that just as, con as is consistent with our 4.2 percent GDP growth, we're seeing a massive amount of wage growth right now uh, compared to what projections were when President Trump took office. And I don't see Sarah telling me I have to stop, so should I keep going? <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll go back there, and then I, I, I've been right-handed, and that's really terrible. I apologize. Thanks, yeah. Uh, to keep these trends going, how important is it for you to have a new uh, North American free trade agreement, including mm -hmm. Canada? Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. And the first thing before I turn to the trade part of the question is that some people have also said, well, sure, the economy is strong, but that's a sugar high. Uh, but it's not a sugar high at all, uh, because what's happened is that the capital spending boom that we promised would happen if we passed the tax cuts is underway. And the cool thing about capital spending is that people build factories, that's what capital spending is, and they do that in the first half of the year. It's up 10 percent since the beginning of the year. Uh, and then in the second half of the year, those factories start producing output, so you get more output. And so the idea that the trend might not continue, that it's a sugar high, is just inconsistent with the form that the growth is taking. And as for NAFTA, Ambassador Lighthizer and, and the whole team have been in negotiations with Canada. We continue to be hopeful that they'll sign on to the uh, 21st century deal with Mexico, which is really a, a better deal for American workers, and, and they should sign on to that. And so I'll come over here, and, and I'll go back to you. Yes, so thanks. Hi. Hi. I'm Anisha with PBS NewsHour. I have a question about income inequality. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about whether or not you've seen income Income inequality shrink, and are you at all concerned about whether or not people that are just poor, not just people that are in the economy, but actual poor people that are living beyond the poverty line, below the poverty line, are they being improved by this economy? Yeah, they, they certainly are. Certainly, uh, think about it. Uh, all the new entrants that, that get a job, uh, that they, they go from having zero wage to having a wage, but they won't necessarily show up in the wage statistics. Uh, those people are better off. Uh, and uh, there are a number of other ways that people are better off, too, because of the growth in the economy, but also because of policies that have given resources to families that are needy. Uh, at the CEA, we put a, out a different report over the summer on what's going on with poverty correctly measured. Uh, and then uh, in the 
stay tuned department, uh, there is important data coming out this week, which will help us look at how income inequality has changed over, not in, in this year, but over the previous year. Uh, my expectation is that it, that data will start to turn and that this year we're going to see a decline in income inequality because blue collar wages are starting to grow. And, and, and it's a final point, and it's a, it, it's a really important point that, that you bring up, and I want to emphasize it uh, because I care so much about it. The fact is that we're at a historic moment because we're deep into a recovery. The unemployment rate is really low, and we've created a capital spending boom. And so normally what happens if you don't have a capital spending boom is that people start to bid up uh, the wages for folks, uh, but they're bidding them up because there's a shortage of, of labor. Uh, what's happening now is they're bidding up wages because people have better machines to work with and their productivity is going up. That means that the recovery can last longer, and that's really, really good for workers, especially at the low end. And so it's precisely at this moment in economic history, if you look at last uh, past economic booms, where income inequality has declined. And if we were to blow it and have a recession because of bad policy right now, then we'd lose an enormous opportunity on income inequality. And uh, then I'll come right here. Yeah. Hey, uh, also two, not and then I guess this is the yeah. last question. Sorry, two quick ones. Sorry. Uh, is he allowed to? You, you tell me. You, 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 do you like this guy? <laughs> okay. Uh, you said I prefer to give blame or credit to policies rather than individuals, but your trend charts start with his election, obviously, when he wasn't even president and didn't put any policies in place. So how does that? How do you? How do you decide when? To, to start that, given that his policies couldn't have been in place for months afterwards. Yeah, so, so Robert Lucas, a uh, famous Chicago who won the Nobel Prize at the University of Chicago, uh, got the Nobel Prize for answering your question back in the early 70s. But but the basic point is that, that America's businesses especially, uh, that their, their activity is forward-looking. And so if you want to model their investment today, then you have to understand the fact that they're forming expectations not just about this month, but about the next five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. And so if you look at what happened the moment that President Trump was elected both in equity markets and, and in sentiment surveys, is that people started to ratchet up their expectations for what would happen to the economy. Perhaps you know, everybody except for uh, Mrs. Clinton's supporters was starting to do that right after the election. And the fact is that those expectations turned out to be rational, because the turnaround that they expected is something that we see, at, as you just saw in the data. Uh, let me hand it back to Sarah now, but close by saying that, that you know anyone who wants to follow up and talk about the data, you can tell I kind of like to do that. So feel free to reach out through the press office and connect with me over at the CEA. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. A couple of uh, announcements and updates, and I'll take your questions. Last week, the Senate Judiciary Committee under Chairman Grassley conducted a thorough and transparent week of hearings, allowing each senator ample time to thoroughly review the nomination of Judge Brett Kavanaugh. Unfortunately, many committee Democrats and protesters attempted to turn the hearing into a circus. Nonetheless, Judge Kavanaugh demonstrated exactly why President Trump nominated him. He showed his respect for the Constitution, impeccable qualifications, and extraordinary temperament. Judge Kavanaugh reinforced the bedrock principles of judicial independence and the rule of law. And we look forward to the Judiciary Committee completing its review and advancing his nomination. On another matter, later today by phone and, and also tomorrow in person at the White House, President Trump is scheduled to receive a briefing from DHS Secretary Nielsen and FEMA Administrator Long. The latest briefing is part of the President's monitoring of multiple storms that are predicted to affect the U.S. in the coming days. The White House has been in contact with governor's offices and local authorities in Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, Hawaii, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York just since Saturday morning. Lines of communication remain open and the federal government stands ready to assist. These tropical storms and hurricanes are very dangerous and we encourage anyone in the path to heed the warnings of state and local officials who have the expertise and knowledge of their communities to provide the best on-ground information. Lastly, we extend our deepest condolences to the family of Secret Service Agent Colin Johnson. Agent Johnson has served his country honorably, first as a Marine and then in the Secret Service. Many of you know him. He was larger than life, literally, was a great friend, father, husband, and member of the United States Secret Service. The men and women in the Secret Service are among the most honorable and dedicated public servants you can find anywhere in the world, and Colin was among the very best of them. And although he was assigned to Chief of Staff John Kelly, he was always there to help anyone who needed it. Our hearts are broken, and Agent Johnson will be greatly missed. Our prayers are with his entire family. And with that, I'll take your questions, John. 
Uh, if I could start out sort of with the topic of the day, and that's the anonymous op-ed in the New York Times. The, the, the president said on Friday that he thought it would be a good idea for Jeff Sessions to look into this. Is, is there anything about what was published by the New York Times that would warrant an investigation by the Department of Justice? Certainly, if uh, there's an individual, uh, whether or not, since we don't know who they are, um, if that individual is in meetings that where national security is being discussed or other uh, important topics, and um, they are attempting to undermine the executive branch, that would certainly be problematic and something that the Department of Justice should look into. So would that be a suggestion of misuse of classified information? I mean, what, what realm would that fall in? Uh, once again, it's something that the Department of Justice should simply look into, and that's for them to make that determination. Yeah, I just did one quick follow-up on that, if I could. Uh, is the White House actively trying to find out who this person is, or do you not really care and you're moving on to other things? Uh, we're certainly focused on things that actually matter, uh, and the staff here that is here to do their job and not undermine the great work uh, that this president and this administration has done, and um, we're going to continue focusing on that. It's uh, frankly, I think, sad and pathetic that a gutless, anonymous source uh, could receive so much attention from the media, and I think that um, the American people would be much better served if we actually spent some time to talking about some of the really important things that are facing our country and the things that this administration is doing to help fix them. Yeah. Justin. Um, has the president received the Kim Jong-un letter from the State Department? And if so, can you share any details about the content or tone or if there were any commitments or requests from the North Korean leader? Yeah, the president has received the letter uh, from Kim Jong-un. It was a uh, very warm, very positive letter. Uh, we won't release the full letter unless the North Korean leader agrees that we should. Uh, the primary purpose of the letter was to request and uh, look to schedule another meeting with the president, uh, which we are open to and are already in the process of coordinating that. The recent parade, parade in North Korea for once was not about their nuclear arsenal. The president has ter achieved tremendous success with his policies so far, uh, and this letter was further evidence of progress in that relationship. A uh, number of things that have taken place, the remains have come back, uh, the hostages have returned, there's been no testing of mi missiles or nuclear material, and the, of course the historic summer summit between the two leaders, and um, this letter is just further indication of the progress that we hope to continue to make. Is the expectation that that second meeting would be here in Washington? I know that's something that the president We'll let you know when we have further details, but it's certainly uh, something that we want to take place, and we'll um, already continue to work on making that happen. Right here. Okay, to follow up on that, you mentioned the remains being returned, the hostages, the lack of testing which were all happening when the president cited a lack of progress uh, and canceled Secretary Pompeo's trip. So other than these really nice words from Kim and a, a parade, what signs of progress warrant this new optimism from President Trump? Uh, again, certainly um, the most recent parade this weekend, one of the uh, first times I believe that we have, they have had a uh, parade similar where they weren't highlighting their nuclear arsenal. We consider that a sign of good faith. And again, uh, the letter from uh, Kim Jong-un to the president certainly showed a commitment to continuing conversations, uh, continuing to work on the progress that they have had since their meeting just a few months ago. and also a continued commitment to focus on denuclearization of the peninsula. I have a separate question on Bob Woodward because um, President Trump continues to call him a liar and says his book is completely a work of fiction. He's also mentioned libel laws quite a bit. Is President Trump considering filing a lawsuit against Woodward? Certainly keep you posted on that, but I think uh, we've been extremely clear from the beginning that many of the book's sources have already spoken out to refute. Uh, a couple of them, Chief of Staff John Kelly uh, aggressively pushed back in this, General Mattis aggressively pushing back in the claims, John Dowd also pushing back uh, against the things that are attributed to him. And a number of people have come out and said that Woodward never even reached out to corroborate statements that were attributed to them, uh, which seems uh, 
incredibly reckless for a book to make such outrageous claims to not even take the time to get a $10 fact checker to call around and verify that some of these quotes were happening. When no effort was made, it seems like a very careless and reckless way to write a book. Sarah. John? Sarah. Sarah, the President said that he was looking into whether or not to take action against the New York Times for publishing the anonymous op-ed. Does the President not think that that op-ed is protected by the First Amendment? Does he really think that the federal government should contemplate action against a newspaper for publishing an article? I think it's less about um, that part of it and whether or not somebody is actively trying to undermine the executive branch of the government and a duly elected president of the United States. They don't want to be part of that process. They shouldn't be here. I see. Guess, he tweeted uh, earlier, and it's been a while since we've had a chance to, to talk to you, um, so this goes back a, a little while, but he he tweeted uh, uh, last week that, suggesting that the Justice Department should not be investigating, should not be prosecuting those two Republican congressmen uh, because it might hurt Republican chances in November. Is, is the president really trying to suggest or, or outright saying that the Justice Department shouldn't be investigating or prosecuting allies of the president if it might hurt? his party's political chances? Certainly the, the president thinks that no one is above the law. Uh, what he would like to see is a, a fair playing field, that there also be, um, there have been a number of uh, concerns raised about individuals both in the FBI and the Department of Justice that have been ignored and we'd like to see those looked at as well. Steve? But, but, but those two prosecutions he doesn't want to go forward because they're his allies? Uh, I can't weigh in right now on an active investigation, but okay. I can tell you that uh, the president doesn't think anyone is above the law, and we're simply stating that there should be cause for concern of, of a number of uh, things that have happened, both in the Department of Justice and the FBI, that we'd like to see those looked at as well. Back to North Korea, how soon would you like to have this second meeting? Uh, I don't have any specifics on the exact timing as these conversations for the second meeting are taking place now, and as we have more details, I'll certainly let you know. Could you just update us on where the Canada trade talks stand? We continue to have uh, ongoing conversations with the Canadians and are still hopeful that we'll come to an agreement with them. Jeff? Sarah, do you know if the president believes these denials that have been coming in from some of his top advisors, uh, or does he believe that it's someone from within? And does he uh, believe that lie detector tests should be issued as the vice president volunteered to do on Sunday? Uh, no uh, lie detectors are being used or talked about uh, or looked at as a possibility. Um, frankly, uh, the White House and the staff here are focused on doing our jobs and trying to show up here every day and do what we can to help better the American people, not deal with uh, cowards that refuse to put their names uh, in an anonymous letter. He tweeted something on Friday after George Papadopoulos was sentenced. He said 14 days for $28 million, $2 million a day, no collusion. What was he talking about, the $28 million? Uh, I'd have to go back and, and check and look at that. I didn't see that. Sorry. Sarah. The, the price tag of the uh, Russia investigation? Because if so, that's highly inflated. Again, I'd have to check, Jeff. I'm not sure of that Sarah. reference. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Is if he'll testify yet or not? If I just follow that. Uh, that's a question decision. I refer you to outside counsel. David? Pennsylvania tomorrow. What does he plan to say, and, and what does he hope to accomplish with this, this year's 9-11 address? Uh, certainly the focus will be uh, on remembering that horrific day um, and remembering the lives that were lost and certainly honoring the individuals um, who were uh, not only lost that day but also put their lives on the line to help in that process. Um, he, he'll be there, and the vice president will be here in Washington, D.C. at the Pentagon. Sarah. David? Sarah. Sarah, thank you very much. Um, I'm assuming you've read Bob Woodward's book. I know a lot of us have. Uh, can we expect, other than repeating denials from General Mattis, General Kelly, John Dowd, can we expect the White House to give us a list of all the things in the book that are wrong and that qualify Woodward to be a liar? I think that would be a complete and utter waste of our time, okay, so well, no. Well, hold on a second. Because then that, that goes to this Quinnipiac poll that came out today that says 55% of Americans believe that the op-ed writer in the Times is right. And the president's getting a 60% negative rating on the honest and truthful. 60% of Americans think he's a dishonest person. So does the president think he can actually win a credibility battle with Bob Woodward 
who's a you know an august member of the press corps, helped take Richard Nixon down, and is a legend. How can you win that credibility battle? Uh, once again, I think I would certainly rather take uh, the actual on-record account from people who are here, who have been working in this building, who have interacted with the president day in, day out, like General Mattis, like General Kelly, like myself, uh, not disgruntled former employees that refuse to put their name on things when they come out to attack the president. Um, I, I think that those are far more credible sources and certainly far more reliable voices within this administration and that can accurately tell uh, what's taken place on the, in the building behind is, is me. Is the president still a credible voice? Absolutely. John. Thanks a lot, Sarah. You've said a lot, the president has said a lot about the publication of this op-ed. Uh, you've called it, the president has called it a betrayal. Uh, you've called it an act of disloyalty. But the president, as has been mentioned quite a few times, even here in this briefing, has called on the Department of Justice to investigate the publication of this op-ed. Uh, there is no violation of the criminal code that goes along with the publication of this op-ed. So I'm a little curious as to what it is that the president believes may have been violated in the law as it relates to the publication of this op-ed piece. Once again, we would consider someone who is actively trying to undermine the executive branch of our government uh, inappropriate and something certainly to cause concern, and they should take a look at it. A violation. Well, once again, we're just saying that this gives a great level of concern, and they should look into it. Well, sir, it's not a violation right of the law. Just, Sorry. Being, just being concerned is not a violation of law. I'm, just so the, it's not, I'm not an attorney. It's the Department of Justice to deter make that determination, and we're asking them to look into it and make that determination, and they certainly uh, are fully capable of doing that. But someone actively trying to undermine the duly elected president and the entire executive branch of government, that seems quite problematic to me and something that they should take a look at. John? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, just to try to specify this a bit, is the White House treating the anonymous uh, op-ed writer as a full-fledged breach of security matter, and is the FBI investigating both staff and their means of communications, cell phones and computers and the like? Uh, I'm not aware of that level. That wouldn't be something I would be a part of. Uh, but certainly, as I just told uh, your colleague, um, we think that there is a concern here and it should be looked into. David? One other question. Sorry, no, Did the... Um, uh, obviously, the whole world watched when Jair Bolsonaro, the front-running Brazilian presidential candidate, was stabbed last week. Has the president called or sent any statement to his family at all? At I'm not aware that the president has, but I do believe uh, members of the administration have reached out, and I'll work to get you the specifics of who that was. Yeah, David? Sarah, what does the president make of all of this talk of the 25th Amendment and some of what he hears on media outlets regarding the word crazy talk. There's a lot of, it seems like there's a lot of talk about that on many of the mainstream media outlets. Uh, I think we would say that it's about as ridiculous as uh, most of Bob Woodward's book. The fact that uh, that's actually being honestly discussed is ridiculous, and frankly, it's insulting to the nearly 62 million people that came out and overwhelmingly supported this president, voted for him, supported his agenda, and are watching and cheering on as he successfully implements that agenda every single day. Sarah. Sager. Sager. Thanks, Sarah. Can you give us a sense of what documents the president is considering for declassification sometime in the next two weeks, and when exactly can we expect them? When we have specifics yeah. on that, we'll can let you know. Give us a sense of what the documents are, though. What, well, I can't get into that right now, but when we have an announcement on it, I'll certainly let you know. Sarah. Stephen. Sarah, Hello. I want to ask you about the Mideast peace process. Because today the State Department announced it is going to close the Palestinian mission here in, in Washington. Uh, the uh, Palestinian ambassador to the U.S. accuses this country of murdering the peace process and undermining its role in the peace process. The State Department says that it's not retreating from our efforts to achieve a lasting and comprehensive peace. Which is it? And how is the United States still an honest broker in this process? Uh, certainly we've been uh, very upfront throughout the process and the fact that we want to see peace, we want to have those conversations, we want to uh, help broker that deal. Um, and we're going to continue pushing forward. Uh, beyond that, I don't have anything specific on it today. To close the office. The Palestinians are saying that the U.S. can no longer be an honest broker. This is another example, they say, of the fact that the U.S. is too aligned with Israel. 
Is that not the case? Uh, certainly, we have a great deal of support with our friend and ally in Israel. Uh, but again, we are as committed today as we've ever been to the peace process. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, on Friday, President talked about a new deal with a trade deal with India. What kind of agreement, trade agreement he's talking about? What kind of agreement he wants with India? I know that uh, a number of administration officials just recently uh, came back from India. They expressed their willingness to uh, negotiate new and better trade deals, and those conversations are at the beginning stages, and we'll certainly keep you posted as we get further in the process. Yeah. Hallie. Thank you, Sarah. I, I one on the ICC, but I want to follow up on Stephen's question on the, the peace process here. And just you say the door continues to be open and that you're still working on it. but. Is it realistic for the president to believe he can actually achieve peace in the Middle East in his first term in office, as he's promised to do, something that his son-in-law is working on as well, when the administration has taken steps that Palestinians, the Palestinians themselves have said do not help? Uh, again, certainly we are very much committed to the process, and we're still hopeful we can get there. The ICC, John mm -hmm. Bolton today said that the administration would sanction uh, the International Criminal Court, which is a move that seems to be a reversion to sort of Bush-era policies. Is it fair to say that this administration is now shifting to, toward a more hardline stance toward the ICC? And if, in fact, it is so feckless, then why is the U.S. so concerned? Uh, certainly, the, the president is committed to defending our national sovereignty and all of our security interests, which would include using any means necessary to protect our citizens, those of our allies, from unjust prosecution by the ICC. Uh, their announcement that they would consider opening an investigation into, among other parties, U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan is a threat to American sovereignty. And if they proceed with that, then the United States would consider those options uh, that Ambassador Bolton laid out today. So why the concern? If the ICC is in fact dead to you, as John Bolton said today, then what is the concern that the U.S. has if in fact they do not move Because they told us they were on the verge of making that decision and we're letting them know our position ahead of them making that decision. Sarah, I'll take one last question, David. Uh, Sarah, the um, editor of the Global Times, which is Beijing's um, premier foreign policy <laughs> outlet, um, wrote on Twitter today that the president blames North uh, China uh, on North Korea quite a bit, but now that there seems to be some improvement in North Korea's stance, um, does China deserve some credit? He suggested that they do. What do you think about that? Does uh, China now deserve credit? believe China's acting better? I think that the, the president deserves the credit in this process. He's been the lead voice uh, and the one that put the initial pressure on North Korea. Certainly, uh, the president has very publicly expressed his gratitude towards President Xi for the role that they played. Uh, he would have liked to have seen them continue to step up and do more. Frankly, we'd still like to see them step up and do more. But um, the credit in this process at this point and where we are, I would say, belongs to President Trump. Uh, and we're going to continue to hopefully work with President Xi and his team and his administration to continue Second, making progress. Given that sure. you're scheduling a second meeting, it sounded like, with, Xi Jinping, uh, with uh, Kim Jong-un, does the president believe that it, it's really he has to negotiate that out almost personally with Kim, given that once the two leaders have left, things seem to go poorly, and then they have to reschedule another meeting? Is it, uh, is it no, that, that level it's, that it has to I don't know that it's gone poorly, considering uh, steps have been taken by the North Koreans to show signs of good faith, of uh, right? but other steps have been taken, so I wouldn't say that it's gone poorly. Right. But at the end of the day, ultimately, it's always going to be best when you can have the two leaders sit down, uh, particularly uh, from the North Korean side. As we know, most of the decisions are going to have to be run through Kim Jong-un. Certainly, um, he's going to want to talk to his counterpart in President Trump. We think it's important, and we're glad that we're making progress. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day. Uh, we've been watching the White House press briefing for about a half hour, the first one in nearly three weeks, and it started with an economic message. Kevin Hassett, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, came out and showed a series of charts that attempted to make the case that it isn't a continuation of the growth started in the Obama years, but a Trump-specific trend that uh, the economy is showing. But he did fess up to the, the president making a mistake in a tweet early this morning. It's uh, not 100 years since GDP is better than the unemployment rate. Just 10, he conceded, though he didn't know how the president got the wrong number. And then uh, Huckabee Sanders came out 
and made a few little bits of news um, indicating that the president has uh, received a letter from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, a warm, positive letter in her description, though she wouldn't go into details. She said it mainly focused on uh, the North Koreans' interest in uh, having another face-to-face -face meeting with President Trump. Um, and uh, there were questions, of course, about that anonymous op-ed published by The New York Times and the White House efforts to find out who uh, wrote that op-ed. Uh, she uh, suggested that the Department of Justice should look into whether uh, the author, if they're receiving classified uh, briefings, is uh, improperly doing so, uh, given the author's uh, concerns uh, about what's going on in the White House, uh, though she said they are more interested in uh, things that are actually important. Weijia Zhe Jiang was sitting there in the front row, asked a couple questions of uh, Huckabee Sanders. Uh, Weijia, so often when there's a controversy, uh, this White House distracts with another controversy. Here they almost seem to trying to be distracting with, you're going to say we're incompetent, we're going to roll out a number of things to demonstrate our competence. What, what's your read on the, the message the White House is trying to drive today? Uh, I believe your question was about whether, you know, the, the administration is trying to distract from the distractions by rolling out this economic briefing. Uh, and he was asked specifically about that, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors asking, you know, is this in direct response to what President Obama said over the weekend that, hey, remember that this economic growth started under my administration. And he said that the briefing uh, on the economic numbers were in the works for weeks. And certainly this is not a direct response to anything that President Obama said. Uh, but, you know, in terms of whether this was meant to be a distraction from the main storylines, you know, certainly wasn't. Because as soon as Sarah Huckabee Sanders, you know, took the podium here, you know, she was slammed with questions that we have not been able to ask, certainly since Bob Woodward's uh, excerpts of his book came out and since the New York Times op-ed. In fact, we have not been able to speak to Sarah Sanders for nearly three weeks. And, you know, those questions certainly dominated the headlines and she was prepared for them. Uh, and she continued to regurgitate the same message, the same official word from the administration that we've heard uh, in other ways, whether it be from President Trump himself or other senior officials who have come out um, and really tried to change the narrative uh, from both the Woodward book and the New York Times op-ed. Uh, yes, yeah, speaking of the op-ed, the White House at the same time uh, seems to be interested in discrediting and or outing the person who wrote it and also interested yeah. in moving forward. Huckabee Sanders was asked specifically whether they would uh, subject uh, White House staff to a lie detector. What, what position does the White House seem to be taking on how they want to move forward on that? Well, Sanders really brushed off this idea that, you know, lie detectors could be a part of screening administration officials for their part uh, in leaking information, even though this was brought up by Vi Vice President Mike Pence, who said he would agree to a lie detector test. And she almost laughed it off and said, no, that is not in the works. They are not talking about that. That is not going to be a protocol here. But you're right. She, you know, did not deny that the president himself is, is fixated with the idea of of finding out who this person is. And that's what we've seen from the very beginning, uh, that, you know, the obsession here has been to find out who the person is and to penalize them somehow, rather than focus on the content of what the writer wrote. And that continues to be the case because Sanders says, you know, he or she is a potential threat to national security. And Brooke, I heard you mention that she also said that perhaps the Department of Justice should look into this, but she was not able to answer the critical question. You know, the Department of Justice has a very specific function to investigate federal crimes. So she was asked multiple times, what is the crime here that the writer uh, committed by expressing their views uh, and by, you know, exercising First Amendment rights, and she was not able to say what law uh, that the author violated, if any. She said, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I just think that the department ought to look into this. Um, and so they still haven't gotten to the heart of that question, and really this could be a missed opportunity by the Department of Justice. Uh, instead of coming out and saying, you know, what we do is investigate crimes, and we do not see exactly what crime would be investigated here. They issued a statement last week saying we do not deny or confirm the existence of any investigations. 
Uh, Sanders was able to point to uh, what she described as good news in North Korean negotiations. Uh, where do things stand with yeah. that? Yeah, some news out of that uh, because she told us that Kim Jong-un uh, sent a letter to President Trump that was received and in that letter, you know, expressed positive uh, message about a second meeting and she said they are working on negotiations to that to broker a second meeting. Uh, of course, no details about where that might be. But, you know, I asked her why, you know, that the president seems to have completely shifted his tone again and reverted back to optimism since just two weeks weeks ago, and you'll remember, he canceled a trip that Secretary Pompeo was supposed to make to North Korea. That would have been his fourth trip to talk about, you know, where plans stand for denuclearization. But President Trump himself cited a lack of progress and canceled that trip. So when you look at what's happened between then and now, here's what's happened. Kim Jong-un has said a lot of really nice things about President Trump. He held a parade that did not showcase intercontinental ballistic missiles as previous parades did. And he sent a letter to President Trump that, again, included these very nice words and positive reinforcement. But what's lacking is any sort of concrete plan, any kind of details about what Kim plans to do to take that step toward denuclearization. But apparently those nice words and the parade was enough to, to change his mind and change his tone because we've seen on Twitter um, especially that he is very uh, enthusiastic about the things Kim has said and done in terms of that parade. But again, no details about what he plans to do to get rid of his nuclear weapons. We've seen that tone go back and forth several times. Uh, Weijia yeah. Zhang at the White House, thanks so much. Thanks, Brooke. Okay, we've got a lot more news ahead. You're streaming CBSN. Stick with us.